Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's live Level Up Conversation, where you, whether you're tuning in live or catching me on the replay, I'm just thrilled and grateful to have you with us. Happy Thursday today. Let's dive right into today's live Level Up discussion. Welcome to Level Up with Winnie Sun. Market Update. Speed Round. Award-winning financial pro. And now, get ready. I present to you, Level Up with Winnie Sun. Hello, friends. It is great to be here with you. I'm Winnie, your host, award-winning financial pro, Forbes contributor, and a CNBC council member. And as you know, we're streaming here live on over half a dozen different platforms. So definitely jump in. Welcome to the show. Let me know where you're joining us from. It is a treat to be here with you. You know we are actually coming in live an hour earlier than our normally scheduled time. So I'm really grateful for those. Well, I see a lot of you already jumping in. Thank you so much for being here. Today, I have a very special guest. I know I kind of clued you in a couple days ago that he was going to be here. And yes, he is here. I'm not going to tell you his name yet because those of you um, who have seen the promo, I know you're excited to meet and, and learn his story more so. But he's a trailblazer in the fields of marketing, social media, customer service, and neurodiversity. That's just the beginning, though. I will have a very fun story to share with you. I kind of like the first time I met him, I was kind of fangirled a little bit. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's you. Um, but yeah, he's a big deal. It's successful companies that he's founded and sold, written multiple best-selling books and hosts a top-rated podcast. He's on a mission to change the way society views neurodiversity and to help people with ADHD. And he's onto something very special that we're excited to share with all of you on. And I'm excited to have you meet him, support him, and learn more about his story as well. But before we get to him, as you know, we've got to talk about how the market closed. Now, the Dow closed down, unfortunately, 221 points today. NASDAQ, though, up 22. We will take it. We'll take that tech-heavy NASDAQ being up and the S&P 500 down seven points as well. A lot of news. And some of the things that we're watching as investors is, of course, the news on the Consumer Price Index, the CPE, which peaked, as you know, in June 2022. It's been declining ever since. Now, historically, the CPA peaks tend to coincide with the start of a recession. Nobody likes to hear that word, but people have been using that for the last, you know, since 2023. So you should probably get comfortable with us talking about it a little bit more because stock market risks have been most pronounced leading up to the CPA peak, but returns have been near the long-term average following the peak. Now, currently it's above 90% as, you know, was the time that, but the currently, I would say there's a lot of things that still need to be flushed out. You may have heard Jamie Dimon, which who is with JP Morgan, hinting that there is pain for investors sooner rather than later. So you've been warm. All right. But we're going to jump for some more fun, though. Right now, we got to talk and we got to introduce my dear friend Peter Shakeman to the show. Peter, welcome. How are you today? Peter is on mute. Peter is on mute because Peter didn't want his dog to bark. It is a pleasure to see you, Winnie. How are you? It's always a pleasure to be here. It is such a treat to have you here. Let me just say, Peter, we shared that you were coming on the show. A lot of people are very excited to meet you. And I know you have something very special to share with us today. But before we jump in there, I talked about this, Peter, earlier. But you're a renowned keynote speaker in marketing, social media, customer service, neurodiversity. And in fact, the New York Times, we got to say this, has called you a rock star who knows everything about social media and then some. I think that's pretty accurate. I mean, not to mention that you sold, you know, this pretty impressive company called Haro um, for who knows how much. But Peter, you're like a big deal. I remember the first time I met you, this was in New York in your neighborhood. And I remember like, Peter Shankman, I'm meeting Peter Shankman. This is really, really cool. In fact, I know you had a really fun story with travel and whatnot. If you if you don't know what I'm talking about, definitely jump on Peter's website because he does share some of that on there. Kind of a big deal. You're kind of a big deal, Peter. How do you feel about that? I think you need to raise your standards. But no, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Winnie, it's, it's always I'm, 
ridiculous to hear you say that because I'm so, you know, in awe of everything you've built and your whole community and everything. So I'm, I'm honored and I'm flattered. And, you know, I just, I just try stuff. The, I, I was born with the, with the, how hard could it be gene? And, and I just, you know, I go and I try stuff and, and some of it works, some of it doesn't. And, but every day you get up and you try again. You try again. And then you also host Faster Than Normal, which is the internet's number one podcast on ADHD. See, even your dog agrees. This is a big deal. Dog agrees that you're a big deal too. Uh, focuses on the gifts and superpowers that come with having a faster than normal brain. So Peter's faster than normal brain. Absolutely. Well, that's, yeah. It's, 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 we just hit 300 episodes actually. Congratulations. Thank that's you. huge. But we got to talk about what's going on with you. Tell me, like, how's life? What have you been doing? And, you know, for those of you who are new to meeting you, maybe you could share a little bit of your backstory with us as well. Yeah, I'm happy to. So, you know, I wasn't supposed to be doing any of this. Um, my career started in the mid-90s. I was working for a small company that no one had ever heard of called America Online. And um, we were this uh, scrappy little startup that was, you know, getting people onto the Internet. And, again, no one knew what that was. Um, was there for about two and a half, three years and helped found the newsroom there. I was a journalism major at Boston University, so I, I was able to translate that into a job I, I had no idea how to do. We made up the rules as we went along, and it was awesome because the company was kind of like, okay, do your job. We don't care how or when you do it, just get it done. And I thought, wow, working, it's my first job out of college. I'm like, wow, working is awesome. You mm -hmm. know, and then um, I left it well. We like 90% of their content team got laid off one random day. And um, get back to New York, where I was born and raised, and I get an offer at a magazine. I'm like, oh, wow, a business magazine this is great. I'll totally take this. I go in the first day for an 8 a.m. meeting and an 8.45 a.m. check-in and a 9.15 meeting and a 10 o'clock editorial thing. And I'm like, okay, this is Russia. I, this is not going to work. And I lasted about four days. Um, you know, AOL spoiled me, but more importantly, I hadn't didn't know at the time, but I realized my brain didn't function like a 9 to 5 brain. Um, and so I, I tried a couple of the jobs, it, nothing really clicked. And so I decided with no experience, I'm gonna go out on my own, I'm gonna launch a public relations agency. It was the start of the dot-com boom. Everyone was getting into that. I'm like, you know, and I, I remember I told my mother, when it fails, not if it fails, when it fails, I'll get a job, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm here assuming I'm gonna fail. It's gonna be 25 years this October and I haven't had to get a real job. Um, I probably worked harder than most people who have real jobs. But it's always been fun. It's well, it hasn't always been fun, but it's, at the end of the day, it's always more fun than it isn't. And I've just been very lucky, and I've I've just used the skills I have and and used the way my brain works uh, to, uh, yeah, to try things. And some of them, the ones that have stuck, have have stuck really well. Well, I think it's more than that, Peter. I mean, you started a company called Help a Reporter Out, Haro. Now, many of you who are business owners who are watching this show are familiar with Haro and just how pivotal and important this company has become to business owners and, of course, the media and the press and everybody else. Peter, I mean, even to this day, I still get daily emails from Haro. You built something pretty, pretty remarkable. To say that, you know, you couldn't take it a night. I mean, like, hey, if that's what it takes, Peter, to be able to build something like that, I think all of us would agree we would give up the nine to five job to deliver that sort of win. You know what's funny about that whole thing is that Harrow came from sort of the weird way my brain works. I would email reporters when I was running a PR firm, I'd email reporters when I had nothing to pitch them. And I'd just say, hey, I know a lot of people. Um, my name is Peter Shankman. I, I, I do PR. I know a lot of people. If you ever need a source on something, chances are I know someone who can help you. I'm not trying to land a client I'm, or, you know, in the media. I'm just being a nice guy. And like half the people would be like, okay, who is this weirdo? What is he trying? You know, he obviously is not just trying to be nice. He wants something. But some reporters would save my email and they email me every once in a while. Hey, you sent me this weird email. Okay. I'm going to see if you're for real. I'm doing a story on X, do you know anyone? I'm, I'm, I'm on deadline. And I'd go through my Rolodex, I'd find someone. And that became Harrow, like a few years later. And it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, I, my brain works in that weird way. And hey, I figured out a way to blow this up and monetize it um, under the guy, you know, because I just wanted to help people, right? And that's sort of the beauty of how my brain works and the beauty of sort of neurodiversity and ADHD as a whole. We think a little differently, but we don't have that gene that says, oh, it'll probably fail. Don't do it. 
we have that gene says, yeah, sure, give it a shot. What's the worst can happen? You can always try again, something else next week. That's a really good gene, Peter. I feel like <laughs> more people should have that gene. And by the way, I want to say a quick hello, Peter. Let's take a minute to say hello. We see Sadiq, who also wants to say hello to you. We see Joshua on YouTube, like also saying hello to you. Marcelo, we see David. We see Vicky also on YouTube Live. Brian Schumann, my dear friend, coming in from LinkedIn Live, also here to say hello. Yeah, everybody is very excited to learn and hear more about this conversation. So we're going to deep dive into this because, Peter, I know, like, you know, we're friends. And, of course, I always like to have you on the show. But we also want to, you know, talk about a new project that you've just launched. Very exciting. Let's talk about the new book. What is the new book? So about six years ago, I wrote a book called Faster Than Normal, which was all about how I use my ADHD um, for productivity and how I'm my, most of my success, if not all of it, is because of, not in spite of my ADHD. Um, with that, you know, had a ton of failures too, but I, after I sold Help Reporter out, I spent a couple of years trying to figure out why I could start a company and sell it in three years, but couldn't remember to take the trash out or, you know, couldn't remember to come home and, and calmly ask my then wife about her day before launching into, blah, 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 you know, about my day. <laughs> When, when I finally got diagnosed with ADHD at 35, everything made a little more sense. I had an idea, you know, you don't live 35 years at that point and be weird the whole time and not think that something's up. But I finally had a name for it. And I realized that even though there were downsides, I could learn how to mitigate them and I could learn how to manage them because the upsides of my sort of faster brain were so amazing. And so I, I wrote this book and it, it, it blew, a lot of people, it blew up. A lot of people were like, oh my God, you're describing me and this and that. And so everyone's like, like six years ago, like, oh my God, that's great. You got to write a kid's book now. And because I have ADHD, I ignored that for like five and a half years. Um, and then one day I'm like, okay, I have a two hour flight. Uh, I'll write a kid's book. And I did it. And so the book is called The Boy with the Faster Brain. It is my first self-published book because Random House, funnily enough, wouldn't, they didn't want me to write this under their label because Faster Than Normal was still doing well. And they're like, yeah, you'll screw up our algorithm. I'm like, okay. Love, love getting punished for being successful. <laughs> so I wrote this kid's book. It's doing really well. The, the, I've been speaking about it at schools and, and whatever. And kids are coming up to me and they're like, I've never met anyone who is like me and who's successful. And it's just like, oh. Aww. But you always have to remember that you're ADHD. So this water I'm drinking, it didn't occur to me. I wanted to make sure I was totally on for your interview. So I did another extra hour on my Peloton about, I don't know, two hours ago. Mm -hmm. It never occurred to me, you know, you're going to be really thirsty <laughs> during your interview. And I'm like, I started, you know, I sat down with you. I'm like, my mouth is incredible. Like, this, oh, damn it. You know, and so it's like, it's those kind of things that as great as ADHD is, you have to learn how to manage it. And, and I've, I've spent years trying to figure this out. And the greatest thing that's been happening of late and COVID had a lot to do with this is that companies are finally starting to understand not only mental health in the workplace, but neurodiversity in the workplace. Um, the Rand Corporation just issued a major study about how the government needs to start hiring more neurodiverse employees, spies, um, intelligence officers, or they're gonna fall behind. And so people are finally, we're finally having this conversation around neurodiversity and around the fact that that companies need to understand it, hire for it, and also sell to it. One out of every eight people in the world is neurodiverse. That's a billion people. That's a lot of people. Well, Peter, you know, you've written a very successful, obviously, we call it an adult book, right, on the topic. So what led you to write a children's book? Because I, you wrote it on a plane in two hours. I mean, I'm not surprised because I know, like, you know how they, they call monk mode where you really focus, but I feel like, Peter, I've known you long enough that you've shared with me uh, on the plane is where you get some of your best work done. So yep. did you write the whole book in two hours? And what made you decide to do a children's book this time? So the short answer and the truth is that I wanted to do something and put something out there that would help, would, would ensure or help ensure that no child today and moving forward would ever grow up the same way I did, um, feeling broken and being told that 
you're interrupting the class and being told that you need to stop being the way you are and why can't you just sit down and shut up and what you know again like i said in the 1970s adhd didn't exist in the 80s in new york city public schools what existed was sit down peter you're disrupting the class again and what existed was the notes home from the teachers every day and me promising my parents that i would do better and i would never talk out or make a joke in class again and the next day the same process what i didn't realize at the time was every time i made a joke um and the class laughed that was literally giving me a hit of dopamine and dopamine is one of the chemicals that help you focus that people with neurodiverse brains don't make enough of right so the hyperactivity aspect of adhd is looking around trying to find something exciting to get the dopamine you need so you can do what it is you have to do and so the you know the beautiful irony i was getting in trouble for wanting to learn in a roundabout sort of way i don't want kids to have to feel that and if i can help push that conversation forward and change the conversation and help parents understand that if they their kid gets this diagnosis they're not broken they're brilliant right and that's the most important thing that kids need to understand that because imposter syndrome is huge with neurodiversity every bit of success i've had i have a really hard time still at 50 years old a really hard time processing and believing that it's because of me it's usually because oh i must have gotten lucky right and that comes from 35 years of being told sit down you're disrupting the class Oh, that's amazing. So this is a book designed for children to read. I'm sure you want parents to read this book as well, right, Peter? Um, so talk to me about this. What You've been doing speaking engagements at multiple schools. What have you been hearing? You did tell me that, like, obviously young people have been coming up to you and feel like they finally have someone who understands them. Have you heard from parents as well? Oh, yeah. I gave a talk. So so I'm, I'm doing – I'm speaking to schools – because I want to. I'm not like charging the schools. I literally go and I talk to schools in the tri-state area of New York because it's the right thing to do. But I, parents come to me afterwards and they say, hey, I work at, insert big company here, can you come talk to our company about neurodiversity in the workplace? I was giving a keynote to a major, one of the top three financial institutions in the world on neurodiversity in the workplace about three weeks ago and got just a ton of emails afterwards from some from just employees who are neurodiverse, but so many from parents who are like, hey, I work at this company. I saw your thing on via satellite. Thank you so much. My child is ADHD or executive function disorder or whatever. And for the first time, I feel uh, hopeful that that he's not going to struggle or that we can get through this. And that to me is huge, right? Because neurodiversity in the workplace is a conversation that definitely needs to happen. And I love that I get to do it. And I love the companies who are finally starting to listen and starting to adapt. Um, but the fact that parents who work at those companies call me afterwards or email me afterwards about their kids is the best. And companies, by speaking about this and going to companies and talking, what they're starting to learn is that it's the premise of what I call curb cuts. In the 50s, when the Second World War ended, I think like something like 600,000 servicemen came home injured, right? And so every city and every town created little ramps at the end of every sidewalk at every block called curb cuts to help injured service men and women get get onto the sidewalk which it did who else did that help pregnant women old people uh package delivery people kids parents with strollers it's one of those things that a company can do to benefit one segment of the company that benefits the entire company as a whole to understand their diversity and to offer these accommodations Something as simple as um, noise canceling headphones, right? When I spoke at a neurodiversity conference at Google, when I was walking on stage, there was a woman behind, backstage. As we're walking on, she has a huge bowl full of fidget spinners and sunglasses in case the lights were too bright and, you know, whatever we needed. Thinking like that helps the company as a whole. It raises everyone, not just one individual segment. I love that. So every company can do something about this. Uh, if you were, Peter, if you were speaking to a group of CEOs and company heads, what would you say would be the first step they should take? Obviously, you know, to have these accommodations is important, but what should, what would your recommendation be if someone says, well, where do we even start? The first place to start is to have an open conversation, to talk about it you know, the people who are neurodiverse today are more than willing to talk about it. This was something hidden 25 years ago, 30 years ago. We talk about it today. Um, 
the people who in a company that are neurodiverse are probably already talking to each other about it, asking questions, asking what can we do to benefit you in this company? What can we do to help you perform better, right? The, the, the small little shifts that are made within the company have tremendous impact on productivity, on an output throughout the entire company. So the first thing to do really talk to your employees, hold the town hall, right? Say, you know, bring someone in, me or someone else, bring someone in where they explain it to the C-level and explain why this is beneficial and why hiring for the neurodiverse and creating an, an inclusive environment, you know, we're doing this for DEI. It needs to be neuro DEI because DEI can't just be skin deep. It needs to be, it needs to focus on neurodiversity as well. Again, one out of eight people, that means one out of eight employees, one out of eight customers are, are, are dealing with this creativity is massive within the neurodiverse community. So if you want your company to be creative, you need to be looking for this and hiring for this and making it a comfortable environment for the neurodiverse. I love that. Now, we're going to get to kids in just a moment because obviously it's a kid's book, but I wanted to build on this question, Peter, if you will. You know, let's talk about what the work environment that we're in now. A lot of people don't go, don't want to go back into the office, right? Hybrid, working from home, seems like it's here to stay. Does this have an impact on the neurodiverse population? Is this an advantage, disadvantage? What's your take? So when the neurodiverse population or when, when everyone was sent home to work back in mid 2020, um, productivity shot up, especially within neurodiverse communities because neurodiverse employees all of a sudden could work the way they wanted to, right? They could work at 4 a.m. They weren't interrupted every 10 minutes by a knock on their cubicle or knock on the door saying, hey, can I run this by you? Thing about one of the things about neurodiversity is that when you get into a zone, you're in that zone. And the disruptions take you out of that zone and you lose your focus. If I get into a writing zone on the plane, I'll write 14 hours, right? If I get into a writing zone in my office, it's not so much because the phone might ring, the dog might bark, whatever. So the neurodiverse were thrilled. Hey, we can work from home and, and output shot up. When companies started asking people to come back, there were serious reservations from everyone, but especially from the neurodiverse community because they had gotten so accustomed to doing so much more. So I've worked with a couple of companies actually more than a couple, several, who we've put sort of ways of work into play. Um, if they're coming back three days a week, right, we create uh, on hot desks, red, yellow, and green desks, where red desks mean don't bother me, yellow desks mean you can bother me, it's important, green desks mean I'm open for any discussion, come knock on my door. And at one company, the execs were totally afraid that everyone was going to go red for three straight days. What wound up happening is they went red for the first day, yellow and green for the second and third because they were so much more productive that first day when no one was bothering them. Again, listen to your employees, understand what makes them want to work. This isn't just about putting a beanbag chair in the corner. It's literally about listening to what works for them. The military um, and the, the intelligence community, you know, it's if you want a pair of noise canceling headphones and you have any sort of security clearance, you literally have to go to a doctor and be labeled as severely disabled. Wow to qualify for, I mean, that's horrible, mm -hmm. right? So so this report referenced that and said, do you realize what you're doing? You're not only making people who already work for you feel terrible, but you're eliminating the chance of anyone with a different neurodiverse brain, you're eliminating the chance that they wanna work for you anyway. Think about how you're doing that. And if you, let's say you do allow headphones or noise canceling headphones, or you do allow anyone to move their desk, if their desk is by a door and they're neurodiverse, every five seconds, the door opens, Oh, what's that? Oh, what's that? There goes their productivity. If you can allow them to move, right? It's the little things. It doesn't need to be massive change. It doesn't have to be massive change. I love that. And it actually reminds me of the time that I met with you in New York, Peter. I remember you showing me these really cool headphones of yours. So I love that. Let's let's talk about kids. Though. we got to come back to this. You know, obviously adults, you had mentioned one of the first steps to do is to have open up honest communication about this, that the neurodiverse population adults are comfortable having these discussions now in the in the workplace and even beyond. But kids, kids obviously feel very insecure, right? When you're growing up, you already feel different. You're really worried about making friends to be accepted. You don't want to be the oddball out with the, the teacher scolding you like, like you experienced, Peter. So how do kids and teachers come together and about neurodiversity. You know, teachers have to deal with large classrooms, maybe 30 kids 
you know, it's like Iranian kittens sometimes. They're so busy. Where do they start? It's true. I mean, that, and that was the thing. You know, when I was growing up, there were no exceptions. You're in the class. You learn the way the whole class learns. Well, mm -hmm. as we've seen and learned, that doesn't work for everyone. Um, I've, I was in a school out in Staten Island, New York, of all things, and they have a whole... Um, every classroom has a little section in the back where anyone, not just neurodiverse kids, anyone can go if they feel themselves zoning out or fading out or if they're tired or they can stand in the corner, they can stand for the lesson. They can um, do squats. They can sit on a bouncy ball. You know, it doesn't take much. It doesn't interrupt the rest of the class and it keeps these kids, puts them back into focus. It's, it's been going on for a year and a half now and the results are massive. So it's these little things that need to be implemented, but before they are, everyone needs to understand sort of why they're doing this. If you, if you put these rules into place without giving the teachers and the staff an understanding of why you're doing it, it's just, oh yeah, we have to do something special for them. No, this helps them learn. They will become better students. They will become better communicators. They will learn better. Uh, they will be less disruptive in class if, you know, if not at all. Here's why we're doing this. So it starts with that communication. It starts with those lessons for the teachers and for the administration explaining why these little changes are massively huge for the students. This is huge. And I, I love how you, you segue this. And, and even when we started the show, Peter, you were saying, well, I knew I was coming on this show. So I jumped on that Peloton for an extra hour. And I remember when I met you, when we met up for Adobe Insiders in New York City, same thing. You're like, well, you know, I have to work out in the morning because I don't work out. Then my daughter doesn't like me so much because I become kind of grumpy, right? So there, you know what you need to do. And some of that is physical activity. This is huge. Something that you've said several times, Peter, is that neurodiversity is a gift and not a curse. Um, explain that, like now that you know you know who you are, what you are, and the gifts that you have. Explain to those who are watching who may not see one out of eight people. We're talking about this is a lot of people. Why is this a gift? It's a gift once you understand how to use it. If you're driving a, a Honda Accord all your life. Nice car, you know, safe car. It'll get you where you need to go. You have certain driving habits. You know that if you're going onto a highway to merge to highway speed, you have to really push down on the pedal. You know, if someone trades you that one day for a Lamborghini and says, go have fun. And you try to drive it the same way you're driving. You used to drive that Accord. You're going to push down on the pedal and go screaming onto the highway and probably crash. The way we were brought up, the way society functions, functions as a Honda Accord. You do this, then you do this, then you do this. And we're trained to learn that way if you learn how to use your brain differently and you learn whether it's through a therapist which i highly recommend therapy um the concept of understanding how your brain can work better allows you to do exactly that and use that um i have two sides to my closet and they're literally labeled one says office slash travel and it's t-shirt and jeans the other says speaking slash tv and it's button down shirt jacket and jeans that's it my suits, my vests, my sweaters, those are all in my daughter's closet. If I had to look every day at all my clothes, oh my God, that sweater, I remember that sweater. God, I think Jennifer gave me that sweater. I wonder how she's doing. I should look her up. It's three hours later, I'm naked in the living room on Facebook and I haven't left the house. <laughs> so there's an image for you. So you learn what works for your brain. I, 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 the exercise helps, the elimination of choice helps. The, um, I, I have a thing in my head called playing the tape forward. If Okay, I'm tired. Do I really want to get up and exercise? Well, how am I going to feel in 12 hours? Right? Is not exercising going to help me or hurt me? And in 12 hours, am I going to look back on this and be happy or upset? Right? And that is usually enough to keep me focused and to say, okay, you know what? Do the workout. You'll feel better. So it's, it's literally these little changes. And again, I'm not anti-med. I have a prescription for ADHD medication. I just take it very sparingly, maybe once or twice a month when... I know I have to do something that day that I don't want to do. My assistant will say, hey, if you don't get your expense reports for the last five speeches to me, you're not getting paid, right? Okay, take the bill. You know, otherwise I can do things like exercise and whatever to help me. And that's the story that I want to tell, right? I'm not anti-medication, I'm not anti-therapy, nothing like that. I just don't think it's this curse and children and adults who are diagnosed are not broken. Neurodiversity does not mean you're broken. It means your brain travels at a different on a different wavelength and once you learn how to use that there's nothing you can't do 
So Peter, first off, I'm going to take a moment and just say, for those who are watching, I know many of our friends are watching here. If you have any questions for Peter, feel free to drop them into the chat because I am monitoring, actually not chat. Go ahead and just reply to or wherever stream you're at, comment below with your questions and we'll get them to Peter. Peter, I want to ask you this, you know, people are watching and are like, wow, that's incredible. You know, Peter understood that this was his situation at age 35. He's learned to do certain things of how to organize his closet and, you know, use exercise and take advantage of medication and therapy as he feels fit. How long did it take for you to establish these patterns? Where, how were you able to distinguish, oh, this works and this doesn't work? Did you do a bunch of research or did you have to do a lot of like self-awareness, all that stuff? It's a constant, I don't want to say battle, because it's not a battle, but it's a constant learning experience. Um, every day is a different situation, right? What am I doing today versus what did I do yesterday versus what am I doing tomorrow? And so you learn a lot of times through mistakes, right? I'm like the king of that. But you learn, hey, this work, this thing I did yesterday, whatever it was, really helped me do this. Put that in the file and know to use that next time. Or this, I tried that and it didn't work. Figure out a different way. So it's a constant um, learning experience, having, again, having a therapist who I talk all this stuff out with is, is, you know, for me mandatory anyway. Um, but yeah, that behavioral therapy of just sort of learning, sort of understanding yourself and understanding what works in every situation and understanding for me, because my brain is so fast, how one decision can lead to a host of decisions that aren't necessarily good. And so the key is let's avoid that first decision. So if someone's watching right now, Peter, and you're thinking, you know, sometimes some of the things that Peter is talking about resonate with me. Sometimes I can easily get distracted. I can feel overwhelmed. Um, someone who's watching, it could be a child, let's just say, what would your recommendation be the first step that they consider to do? The first thing to do, you know, if you're a child, talk to your parents, talk to your parents about it. If you're an adult, you know, if you want to get tested. If you want to go talk to a therapist and get, you know, an official diagnosis, feel free. If, if you don't, that's fine too. You know, I am not a doctor. I said all the time for me, just having a name and a label for what it was helped tremendously. But at the end of the day, um, I know how my brain works. And because I've spent what 15 years, I mean, technically 50 years learning how my brain works the last 15, trying to understand it. Um, just understand yourself. Nobody is perfect. No one's expecting anyone to be perfect. And every brain is different. So you do what works for you, whether that's therapy, whether that's trying different routines, whether it's exercise, changing the way you eat, change, getting more sleep, whatever it is, even medication, you know, talk to someone you trust, a, a, a partner, a spouse, a therapist, and sort of work out that plan. But do it with the knowledge that you're not broken. Do it with the knowledge that this isn't a debilitating disease that's going to haunt you forever. I love that. I love that. That you know, it's a gift, like you said, it's a gift. You were born this way, and you just need to work, figure out how to, to, I guess, live your best life. I love that. Okay. All right, Peter. Let me ask you this: What have I not asked you yet that I should have asked you? One of the best things that anyone with ADHD can do is figure out ways to slow themselves down before they meet or talk to or come home to someone who is not neurodiverse. Um, for me, I didn't realize that until too late. My thing was I, I'd walk home. It would be like a 20 minute walk. I'd be all hyped for dopamine from the, from the walk. And I burst in and be like, blah, 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 my day and my day. And my, you know, a, a, an ex-girlfriend who I'm still very close friends with told me, she goes, yeah, whenever you come home, it was always the Peter Shankman show. It was never about me. And it took me years to learn that. So now, whether I'm going into a meeting or going into someone's office or even just coming home to the dog and, 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 you know, with my kid, um, I stop before I open the door, I take three, four or five very deep breaths. I just catch myself. I figure out where I am. I, I retrain my head. I'm saying, okay, you have this dopamine or you have this excitement. I mean, I live in New York city. You walk outside and you're hit with dopamine. So I take a minute and I just breathe, right? If I'm not, if that doesn't work, if I'm not ready to come home, I'll stay in the hallway or I'll go back downstairs or whatever, just to, so that when I walk in, it's not all about me. It could be about me later. Right. But it, it doesn't, it doesn't help anything when you walk in and the room explodes because you're just so hyper. It's all about, you know, no one benefits from that. So that's, I think 
probably the one thing I learned too late. Um, you know, and you still work on it. You're really excited. Of course you want to share it. Breathe. I love that. You know, I think, Peter, even a lot of folks watching who are not neurodiverse could learn that lesson as well. So amazing, no amazing. So much for sharing that. Um, thank you so much. This is huge. And I thank you so much, everybody who's tuning in. I see a lot of quotes. I think that my dear friend Brian Schumann has been sharing um, Peter Shakeman's isms all over social media. So thank you so much, Brian, for doing that. Mar Marcello had a sort of an aha moment, and we love to see that as well. Um, and we've been sharing your comments, and we really appreciate you tuning in, of course, getting the message out. But most importantly, let's not forget that Peter's book is now currently available. For those of you who are watching and you love this topic or you know someone in your life that you think would benefit from getting a, a copy of this book. We're going to share it right on the screen. Um, he didn't ask us to do this, by the way. This is because we care about Peter. And this is where you can see Peter's book. As you can see, it's a number one bestseller. So not doing so bad, but we can push it even higher. Being number one, the ADHD, I mean, I feel like we might as well take Peter all the way to the top, right? So you can order a book there, Peter. And every time you order a book, Peter grows a little heart. He gets really happy. He feels really good. Right, Peter? Totally true. Totally true. And, and also, I should mention that I love talking about this stuff. I am at Peter Shankman on, on all the socials, and I, I welcome the conversation. I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. I love it. Yeah. And then if, yeah, if you're looking for a speaker, Peter, I know is a very, very prominent speaker. In fact, I know he's, he's one of Adobe's uh, favorite speakers. I know because we're part of the same group and I was like, Oh, Peter's speaking again. Oh, Peter. <laughs> so it's really, really fun. All right. So, so it's, it's all true, Peter. We so appreciate you. If you don't already make sure to follow him on social, where do we go, Peter? I'm at Peter Shankman everywhere. My my website is shankman.com. My email is peter at shankman.com. I don't use Twitter that much anymore, but I'm on Blue Sky and everywhere else. Instagram is uh, pretty big for me. I, I recruit my daughter into doing reels all the time. So yeah, look, just anywhere you want. And the podcast is called Faster Than Normal <laughs> as well. Amazing. We need to follow on Blue Sky. I'm on Blue Sky now as well. So we'll have to cool. make sure to connect there. And I'm at Winnie's son on, on Blue Sky if, for those of you who are jumping over there as well. Huge thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. And thank you so much for our incredible audience, our friends who are watching Level Up Live. If you enjoyed this video, please give us a chance to give us a like and subscribe. And if you share the show with those that you care about on your different social media platforms, please tag me at Winnie Sun so I can thank you properly on our next show. And as a reminder, you're going to be able to watch full episodes of Level Up Live with Winnie Sun on NASDAQ, Amazon Fire, Samsung, Roku, and many other streaming platforms. And don't forget to check out Yes Factor with Winnie Sun on Apple Podcasts and the LinkedIn Podcast Network. With that, I thank you so much, my friends, for being here. An even bigger thank you, of course, to the one and only Peter Shankman. Thank you so much, Peter, for being here and making the time. We'll see you all very soon. And for those of you who are joining me again tomorrow, we will be back with In the Loop with Greg Nibbler. Uh, so we hope to see all of you tomorrow as well. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Annie. Thank you.